هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما جاء بعضنا السّستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته this is going to be part two of Surah al mutaffifin part two in the sense that attempt number two, bi'idhin Allah ta'ala. May Allah grant us tawfiq and accept from us all. With that having been said, Surah al mutaffifin let us start off firstly with, is this a Makki or a Madani Surah? Who was here on Friday, oh sorry, who was at Edmonton Trail on Friday night? Go ahead, break it down for me. Makki or Madani Surah? Why? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Go for it. Fantastic. So this is one of the biggest reasons that when you talk about issues of Aqidah, predominantly those are issues that are related to Medina. As Hisham mentioned as well, the verses are very, very short. A second indicate or third indication that this is Makki as well is that if you look at, and this is a very interesting concept to look at, how the Mufassirun made Tarji, how the scholars of Tafsir preferred one opinion over another. So they said, if you look at these verses, these are talking about business, right? Those that cheat the scales. And who were the businessmen? Was it the Quraysh or was it the Ansar? And you look at the Quraysh were the actual businessmen. The Ansar, they were busy with agriculture. So this is also one of the proofs that they used. The last proof, and this is probably perhaps the most significant of them, was the fact that all of the narrations that talk about uh, this being a Madani Surah, particularly the narrations of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, they're all weak in their narration. There's always either some sort of weakness in the chain. So it's clear indication is that it is from Mecca, and this is what the majority of scholars of Tafsir said. So now, with that having been said, what is also important to understand is that this was a foretelling of what would take place in the future. So if you look at what used to happen in Medina inside of the date markets in particular, in Medina they used to cheat the skills. So if someone comes to buy something, they give him less than they actually bought. And when they try to buy something, they try to get even more than what they actually paid for. So this is a foretelling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the people in advance that this, is not, this cannot take place. This cannot take place. And we'll get into the details of that. Now what's also important to highlight over here, again, is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing the temperament of the Muslims in terms of their akhlaq. So one of the things that would differentiate the Muslim from the non-Muslim was the way he conducted himself. So if a person was truthful and honest, then insha'Allah he was from the Muslims. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, that when it comes to business transactions in particular, it is very important to be honest at that time. There's actually a very nice story of one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah by the name of Abu Yusuf. Abu Yusuf was one of the main students of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. And his students came to him and they asked him, O oh, Imam, O oh, Shaykh, will you not write us a book on piety? Will you not write us a book on piety? And then he, wrote, he responded by saying, I've already lit, written a book for you in Mu'amalat. I've already written a book for you in Mu'amalat. Mu'amalat is dealings and in transactions with people. So if you want to see the level of piety an individual has, look how he is in the way he transacts with other people, in the way he interacts with other people. And that is where you will see a person's true piety. It's not about you know, how you are when you pray, it's not about how you are when you're in the masjid, it's about how you deal with other people. There's a narration of uh, Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, where he was asked about you know, what is good conduct. And one of the students, he asked him, he said, Ya Imam, I was told that nine-tenths of good conduct is the way that you interact with other people. And he said, no, that is not true. But rather ten-tenths of it, meaning all of it, is how you interact with people. So if you want to talk about good akhlaq, you want to talk about piety and wara and taqwa, it is about the how, how we interact with one another. The second thing we want to look at is the relationship with this surah and the surah before it. So the surah before it was Surah Al-Infitar. 
And in Surah Al-Infitar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind. And He mentions three things. الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ فَعَدَلَكَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created you, He fashioned you, and He created a balance in you, He proportioned you. Now the significance of this verse is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He balanced us, it means that as human beings, we're always meant to be in a state of balance. So sometimes you'll wonder, why do you have that innate desire? If something is out of place, you need to put it back properly. That desire from the inside is that you were created to be balanced. You were created in proportion and everything needs to be in its proper place. So in order for someone to be out of place, to cheat the scales, he actually has to go against his natural desire on the inside. Because his natural desire is to be balanced and to be proportioned. And we'll derive some other correlations as we move on to the surah, into the surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the surah, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ That, woe to al-mutaffifin. The term wail over here. The scholars of tafsir differed over what does wail actually mean. And they came to the conclusion that the term wail is an indication of destruction. So when you want something completely destroyed, completely annihilated, you will say wail to it. Right? So when something has been bad, you want something destroyed, you want you know, Allah's curse upon that thing, then this is when the term wail is used. Some of the scholars of tafsir, they actually said that wail is a valley from the valleys of the hellfire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for particular people. And this particular people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to in this surah is the mutaffifin. So who are the mutaffifin? From a linguistic standpoint, the mutaffif is the one that cheats the scales. So anyone that tries to cheat the scales, then they are a mutaffif. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions specific characteristics about them. He goes on to say, That those who when they receive by measure from men, demand full measure. And when they give or wait to other men, they give less than what is due. So let us take an example. Someone goes to the date market and they're buying dates. Okay, they've bought five kilograms of dates and the, when the person weighs the scales, it comes out to, let's just say, 4,995 grams. So literally five grams are missing. It's not even like the size of that. That's what's missing. And he says, no, I'm paying for five grams. I want the full five grams. So he'll make the person give him an extra date, go over five kilograms, but he won't pardon over that five grams. Now, why is this something significant? We'll get to that in the next verse as well. So then he says the opposite of this as well. That when he is selling, had he been the one that is selling, and someone comes to him and he says, I want five kilograms of dates, he will give him 4,995 grams. And if there's five grams missing, he'll try to convince the other person. He'll say, it's only five grams. Brother, we're you know, brothers in the deen. It's just five grams. Let it go. Now that's the way, unfortunately, how Muslim businessmen are. That when it comes to buying, they're very you know, strict and, and stingent. When it comes to selling, they want you to be merciful and pardoning with them. Now the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he puts all of this into context. He said, may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala brighten the face of the individual samhan ila ba'a wa samhan ila ishtara. That may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, you know, illuminate the face of the individual who is very merciful when buying and very merciful when selling. That if there's a little bit missing, let it go for the sake of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is the one that is going to bless that transaction. Now putting this in the modern day context, you'll notice that you know, nowadays business transactions don't really take place like this. Very seldom will you actually go to a market and buy something by weight, you know, unless you're buying fruits or, or vegetables or something like that. So now in our day and age, how would we relate to this? The way that we would relate to it is the individual that is working on an hourly basis. An individual that's working on an hourly basis. So let's just say he gets paid for nine hours a day, he's getting paid $10 per an hour, he's meant to get $90 for that day. But in these nine hours of work, he took a break for lunch for one hour. And then he took a break for Dhuhr and Asr. He took some bathroom breaks, and sometime in between, he checked his emails, went onto Facebook, went onto Twitter. So altogether, he did maybe about seven hours, seven and a half hours of work, but he wants his wage for nine hours. He wants his wage for nine hours. Now looking at this scenario straight on, as a Muslim, this is not permissible. 
as a Muslim for you to do this, that you're charging for nine hours, but you only work seven and a half hours, this would not be permissible. So the general case is that the Muslim is meant to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only pay for or only get paid for that which he worked for and only get paid for that which he worked for. So now when would this become permissible for a Muslim? A Muslim is working on a case by case on an hour by hour basis and you know he's only worked seven and a half hours and he's getting paid for nine hours. How would this become permissible? This would become permissible my dear brothers and sisters if your boss actually knows what you're doing. So if your boss knows that, you look, you're taking a one hour lunch break, he knows he doesn't have a problem with you checking your emails, he doesn't have a problem with you taking your salah breaks, then this is perfectly fine. This is perfectly fine. As long as your boss is content with it, he has no complaints, it's fine. But what you see a lot of the times, unfortunately, is that Muslims try to hide this. They try to hide the fact that they're going to pray, try to hide the fact that they're taking a prolonged lunch, try to hide the fact that you're checking their emails and their Facebook. If you're trying to hide this from your boss, this is a clear indication that you're doing something wrong and this should not be done. There's an interesting story that uh, Sheikh Hassan told me, the other Imam. Um, he was telling me once that his teacher told him about a non-Muslim, that he was an auditor and he was auditing the hours of a consultant that they hired. And this consultant is a, is, a, is a very famous sheikh that he travels around the world just advising banks and you know organizations how they can make their finances Islamic. So this individual, when he's auditing this consultant's um, you know, transaction in terms of how much he's charging the company, he notices that every day he'll deduct an, uh, half an hour from his time. So even though he's working for like 10 hours a day, he'll deduct half an hour from his time. So he wondered, you know, why would he do this? So he went to the consultant and he asked him that, you know, why is it that each day when you give in your hours, I see you here for 10 hours, why is it that you're deducting half an hour off the times? He said, this half an hour I'm deducting is my personal time. I'm not actually working during this time. And the man responds by saying, but that's normal. You know, we all take smoking breaks. We all take breaks to go to the bathroom. This half an hour doesn't do any harm. Why don't you just take the money? And the man responds, he says, I don't feel comfortable for this because this is the time that I'm taking to worship my Lord. And I know that He is rewarding me for this and I don't want any you know, compensation from the, from the world for this. This is just between me and my Lord and I don't deserve to get paid for that. And when the man heard this, he started breaking down in tears. And this was one of the reasons that caused him to accept Islam. That he saw the honesty of this businessman and he said that there has to be something special. That, you know, why would a person sacrifice free money and then talking about praying and worshipping the Lord during the day? This was enough for him to accept Islam. So when it comes to business transactions and the way we conduct ourselves, it is dependent upon the Muslims that we have the highest standards. That, you know, be pardoning when you give and give more than you actually are, you know, are given. That is the way that the Muslim is meant to be. That the hand that gives is always better than the hand that receives. So when it comes to those transactions, particularly when we work in the, our work you know, standard uh, of ethics, it has to be of the highest of standards, bi ta'ala. Now, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala particularly mention this? This is just a symptom, right? The fact that these people are cheating people is just a symptom. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to go on to give us two of those causes. And this is what you want to look at, that when you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, a lot of the times we get so focused on, you know, the symptom itself, rather than analyzing what is the root core problem. So let's just say for a brother, he's not growing his beard, right? And you keep telling the brother, brother, you need to grow your beard, brother, you need to grow your beard, brother, you need to grow, need to grow your beard. What you're failing to realize is that this is just a symptom of the problem. There's a greater issue at hand. That perhaps, you know, he's not comfortable yet with growing a beard. Perhaps he doesn't know about growing the beard. Perhaps his iman isn't at that level where he can go to his work while growing a beard. You know, there's so many issues that are coming to play. So when you're dealing with troubles, uh, with troubles and you're troubleshooting something, try to find out what is the root cause rather than focusing on the symptom itself. So Allah has given us the symptom now that these people cheat. Now why are they actually doing this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, uh, that these people do not think that they will be resurrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us one of the effects that the pillars of faith have. So the, in the famous hadith of Jibreel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger is asked, what are arkan al-iman? What are the articles of faith? And then he goes on to say, one of them is to believe in the day of judgment. 
And here we see something very important, that our belief in the Day of Judgment is actually meant to change the way we conduct ourselves. That it is meant to remind us how we are meant to interact with other individuals. It is meant to remind us that we will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for each and everything. For each and everything. So the belief is meant to have a manifestation on the limbs itself. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when the person doesn't believe in the Day of Judgment, it will cause him to do whatever he wants. Because without fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without fearing question and being asked, a person will have no sense of responsibility. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, لِيَوْمٍ azim," And that day of judgment is indeed a great day. Now, azim, it comes from a very interesting root word. That azim, as we know it, is, is meant to be a day of greatness. When something is great, we say this is shay'un azim. Where does azim actually come from? If you look at the bone in the human body, or bones in the human body, they are known as azam. And you'll notice that the adam is the strongest part of the body. So you slap someone, it's not going to have that much of an effect. But when you punch someone with your knuckles, all of a sudden it's giving them a black eye, it's leaving a bruise behind. Because that is the hardest part of the body. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about liyawmin azim, it's going to be a very tough day, a very rough day. It's not going to be an easy day. And this is where the term azim actually comes from. This is where the word azim actually comes from. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That that is the day all of mankind will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why is this standing significant? This standing is significant for two reasons. Number one, is that those that denied the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to pray and they refused to pray. So on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it mandatory upon them to do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will truly show them who is in power. So if you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, you'll have nothing to fear in the akhirah. But those that didn't submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will force them into submission, will force them into submission. Now it's also significant for another reason, that the leaders of the Quraysh in particular, they loved for the people to stand up for them. So if one of the leaders of the Quraysh walked in, even though you may not have any relation to him, to him, ship to him whatsoever, everyone in this room would have to stand up. And if you didn't stand up, you'd be in a lot of trouble. You would be in a lot of trouble, and this would be considered a sign of disrespect. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that the one that loves that the people should stand for him, will not enter into paradise. The one that loves that the people should stand for him, shall not enter paradise. So now how do we understand this statement? That let's just say someone you love comes into the room and you're sitting down on the floor. Should you stand up for them or should you not stand up for them? We say that this depends on the reason why you're standing up for them. If you're standing up because you love them, then this is something that is completely permissible. So for example, when Fatima radiallahu anha, she used to walk into the room. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to stand up for her and he would embrace her almost on a regular basis. So every single time almost he would stand up and he would embrace her. So this shows if it's done out of love, there's nothing wrong with it. But if it's done out of, you know, fear of an individual, if it's done out of the person's position or a person's authority, then this is something that is not permissible. This is something that is not permissible. That type of standing is meant to be Allah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that is one of the lessons that the scholars derived from this verse. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That on that day, that standing that is done out of fear and out of, you know, position and authority is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone on that day. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talk about their scrolls. He says, Kalla in the kitab al fujari lafi sijin. That then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say kalla. And when kalla is used, it is used to deny something that has preceded it. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denying over here? I want you to think about this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying kalla, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denying over here? What is he saying? No, this is not true. Go ahead. Fantastic, yes. That is what exactly he's denying. The belief of the mushrikeen. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is absolutely not true, this is rejected and ha holds no basis whatsoever, the belief that mankind will not be resurrected. Because not only is this textually true, but even logically this has to be true. That if, Allah, that if this world came into creation, there has to be a sense of justice in it. And that ultimate sense of justice will be on the day of judgment. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say that the books of the Fujjar are, are Fi Sijin. Now the books, we've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks in the previous surahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give each and every person a scroll on that day of judgment. And that scroll will have each and every single thing that they did. The good deeds, the bad deeds, the mundane deeds that had nothing, that had no you know, good or bad to it. All of this is going to be documented. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, where are these books being stored? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the books of the righteous are in one place and the books of the unrighteous are in one place. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say that the books of the Fujjar are in the Sijin. Now who are the Fujjar? The term Fujjar is the, ter is the plural of the term Fajr. Is the plural of the term Fajr. And for those of you that were there on Friday, who remembers where the term Fajr comes from? Where does the term Fajr come from? Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that the word uh, Fajr it, uh, means like break. Right? So someone who, who breaks the bounds, uh, boundaries that they lost from the Fantastic. So the term Fajr, it means that the light breaks through the darkness. So similarly, the person over here, he's bound by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he constantly breaks those laws without any care, that is when he becomes a fajr. That is when he becomes a fajr. And that is the relationship between the term fajr and the term fajr. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the books of the fujjar are in the sijin. And the term sijin comes from the term sijin, which is a prison. So now when you think about prison, what do you think about? You will think about, you know, a dark place, a very disgusting and filthy place, a very congested place. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. This is where their books are. Now the scholars of tafsir, they differed specifically that, you know, where is this sijin? Is it in the lowest depths of the hellfire? Is it in the lowest depths of the earth? Where is it? What they concluded with is that it is a dark, filthy, disgusting place that is from the lowest of low places. Because the opposite is going to come later on when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the books of the righteous. He says that the books of the righteous are fi illiyin. And the illiyin comes from ulu, that they're in a high and raised place. So the opposite of it for the unrighteous would be that they're in a lowly and filthy place. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا سِجِّينَ And what will make you truly realize how low, disgusting, filthy, congested of a place this actually is. Kitabu Markum, that this book is going to be a registered book. Now when uh, the scholars of Tafsir discussed the term Markum, they talked about two things. Number one is that it is Markum in the sense that it cannot be edited. So that once something is written down in this book, it's not going to be erased. You know, similarly how you write in like chalk, you, you can wipe it off easily, or perhaps you even write by pen, you can just wipe it out. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example that the books are marqum, and marqum is like when you engrave something into stone, that once it is set in stone, there's no taking it off, no matter what you try to do. The second understanding of the term marqum was that it's actually numbered. So you know how you'll have like a receipt of items, you'll have like item number one, item number two, item number three. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that all of our deeds, particularly the bad ones for the fujjar, they're going to be numbered. And they will see how many bad deeds they actually did. That all of them are going to be numbered one by one. So there's a very detailed account of what is being done. There's a very detailed account of what is being done. وَيْلٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ so on that day, the, the people that denied the Day of Judgment, that denied standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be completely destroyed. They will be completely destroyed. Now what's interesting over here is where the term deny comes from. So the term deny comes from takdhib. And its original term is kathaba yukathibu takdhiban. And kathaba with a shadda on it, this is what it actually means to deny something. So when you deny that you've done something, this is known as takdhib. Now the original form of this is kathib. And kathib means to tell a lie. Kathib means to tell a lie. 
So the original form of denying something is to lie about something. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is saying, and then both of these could be understood in the same way, that the destruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon those people that deny, but also those people that perpetually lie. And the greatest of lies that you can tell is that you don't believe in Allah or that you will not stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is how the term takdeeb is such a comprehensive term that is it encompasses the greatest of lies and it encompasses those that deny as well. And that is the relationship between the two. الَّذِينَ يُكَذِّبُونَ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to specifically mention what it is that they're denying. That they denied the day of judgment. Now this becomes significant because we mentioned that this is one of the root causes. So one of the root causes of people being unjust and being oppressive is that they denied the day of judgment. Now this denial of the day of judgment, it's not just in the form of belief that someone will say, I don't believe in the day of judgment. But more importantly, it comes in the form of action. So if your actions don't represent your belief in the Day of Judgment, it's as if you're denying it. It's as if you're denying. So its presence is as good as its absence. So someone will claim to have belief in the Day of Judgment, but you see that they're cheating everyone. You see that they're constantly lying. So where is this belief in the Day of Judgment if it's not being manifest in on the limbs? Now this is the first root cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go on to tell us a second root cause as well. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَمَا يُكَذِّبُ بِهِ إِلَّا كُلُّ مُعْتَدٍ أَثِيمٍ And no one denies the day of judgment except for the one that transgresses and is a theme. So the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses two attributes over here for the transgressors. Number one is mu'tadin. And mu'tadin comes from i'tada, which means to go over the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set limits of al-halal and haram. The person that breaks those boundaries of halal and goes into the haram, he is known as mu'tadin. And a theme, it comes from the term ithim. It comes from the term ithim. Now this is an interesting discussion, and this is for you, Muhammad, that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he breaks down every single sin that can be done into 15 terms. He breaks them down into 15 terms. And the smaller sins, they are generally known as ithm, they're known as dhunub, they're known as sayyat. These are usually the smaller sins. And the biggest sins by consensus are the sins of kufr, shirk, and nifaq. These are the three biggest sins. And then you'll have all the sins in between, which are sins like fisk, sins like, you know, following the path of other than the believers, ittiba' sabil ghayr al-mu'mineen, and speaking without knowledge, all of those sins will fall in between. And these are specific sins, that, or these are specific titles that are given to sin. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he enumerates 15 of them in the Qur'an. So there are 15 ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines sins in the Qur'an. And I actually look them up if you want them in English later on, inshallah. So we'll share that later on, bithnillahi ta'ala. So ithim is one of the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to. And when a person perpetually does ithim, he becomes a theme. Now what is ithim within of itself? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in an authentic hadith, he says that ithim is ma haka fi sadrik. That ithim is that sin that bothers you inside of yourself. So when you see something happening, you're doing something, and you feel some sort of uncomfort in your heart, this is a sign of ithim. Right? This is a sign of ithim. So here the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is telling us that the concept of ithim has a close relationship with the heart. So when a person perpetually does sin, that indication that you're doing wrong, it will disappear. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here is that what caused these people to become transgressors and what caused these people to deny the day of judgment was because they didn't monitor their, the state of their hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to, refer, to emphasize this concept later on. When he says, That if our verses are recited to these people, then they say that these are the tales of the ancient. So this is one of the first indications that a person has a diseased heart, that he doesn't pay any attention to the texts of Revelation. Now one of the distinguishing characteristics of Islam, the distinguishing characteristics of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is the way that they uphold the texts. So the difference between the sects, you'll see a wide variety of things. So you take a group like the Mu'tazila, 
The group like the Mu'tazila, they paid a lot of emphasis to human rationale and intellect. But when it came to the text, they said this is completely open to interpretation. Then in fact, you know, this may not even be, you know, a, a real text because this is, not, this is something that is created. It's not something that is, uh, you know, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So they didn't magnify the text. And that is why when you look into the books of Aqidah, into the books of, theology, of Muslim Sunni theology, you will see that one of the points is that they do ta'zim al-nusus. And ta'zim al-nusus means that they magnify and glorify the text of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So one of the first indications of a diseased heart is that when someone narrates a hadith or an ayah to you, you say that this is insignificant, this is irre irrelevant, Yet, you know, it's not something up to, that's relevant in our times. So this is a clear sign of a diseased heart. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of the past. That they used to say that this is nothing except asatir al awwaleen That this is nothing except stories of the people that came before us. It's not relevant. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to give the second reason, the second root cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Kalla bal rana ala kulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. That nay, it is their hearts that have become rusted due to the sins that they used to commit. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again is negating this concept that the Qur'an is asatir al awwaleen that is irrelevant in our times. Allah denies that and then He says the reason why you have this belief is because you've done so much sin that you can no longer distinguish between right and wrong. And this is in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu as is reported in the sunan of Imam al-Tirmidhi that when the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commits a sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a black dot on their heart. And a person will continue to do these sins, excuse me, until their heart is completely closed off. It is completely black. Now what happens when a heart becomes completely black? I want you to think about this when you have tinted windows. What happens when you have tinted windows? When you have tinted windows, that light no longer penetrates through, right? It repels that light away from you. Similarly, when an individual has a black heart, guidance is repelled. It doesn't seep into the heart. And until a person repents for each of those sins, those dots will not be removed. And this shows us the significance of repentance and making tawbah. That if you want to see why you're perpetually singing, sinning and why you're you know, constantly making bad decisions, Look at how many sins you've committed and then look at how many times did you repent for those sins. And you'll notice that there will be a correlation there. That because you were not repenting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped guidance to coming from your heart. And this is one of the clearest signs that in our day and age, when you look at, you know, why is it that people aren't focusing on greater things in their life? And we're talking about the average disbeliever, you know, who's in college and university, a bit older than that. Their primary focus is just working and on the weekends getting completely wasted, right? They will work during the week and during the weekends it's just about getting so plastered that you don't even remember what you did, right? This goes back to the issue of sin, you know? They continue intoxicating themselves to the degree that they no longer focus on the greater priorities in life. So let them stop sinning first and then you'll notice that they'll start asking those questions that they should be asking. That you know, why was I created? What is my purpose in this life? They need to be able to think and to reason, but if you're always being distracted with you know, drugs and alcohol and other things, then when will you actually come to terms with it? When will you actually come to terms with it? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He teaches everyone a very important lesson. That one of the major effects of sins is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes guidance away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just snatch guidance away from people, but rather it's when people continue to sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't repent, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bit by bit takes that guidance away. So much so that even if you were to recite verses of the Quran to those people, it would have no effect on them. They would be like, who cares about it? It's just a verse of the Quran, as if it had no value whatsoever. Due to the sins that they committed and due to them not paying attention to their hearts. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعْ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِكَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ That on that day, one's wealth and one's children will have no effect except for the one that came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart. Except for the one that came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart. So that is focus on purifying our hearts so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can accept our deeds. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Kalla innahum arrabbihim yawma idhin la mahjubun. That nay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day will veil himself from them seeing him. So one of the greatest delights of paradise is the fact that the believers will get to see their Lord that created them, the Lord that was so generous to them, the Lord that was so merciful to them. That this is one of the greatest pleasures and honors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give to His creation. And then the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will veil them from this. And again, this goes back to the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the believers, in fact, will get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. That the companions were sitting with the Messenger of Allah and they said, Ya Rasulullah, will we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter? And he said, Yes, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like you see the moon, Laylatul Badr. Just like you saw the moon when it is in its full glowing effect, that is the way you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any barrier. So one of the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that they will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. And this is the most greatest of blessings that the believers will have and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from them. Amen. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, ثُمَّ إِنَّهُمْ لَصَالُ الْجَحِيمِ And then these people will be thrown into a blame, into a blazing fire. So the fires will be lit and they, these people, will be thrown into the fire. ثُمَّ يُقَالُ هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تُكَذِّبُونَ Then it will be said to them that this is a result of what you used to deny. Or this is what you used to deny. Both This verse can be inter uh, interpreted in both ways. That this is a result of what you used to deny, meaning that they used to deny the Day of Judgment and now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has thrown him in the hellfire. Or this can be understood in that this is the result of what you used to deny. So the result of you belying and denying the Day of Judgment, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has thrown you into the hellfire. ثُمَّ يُقَالُ هَذَا الَّذِي uh, so Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, كَلَّا إِنَّ كِتَابِ الْأَبْرَارِ لَفِي عَلِّيِّينَ Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to talk about the righteous. He goes on to talk about the righteous. Now, the term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for righteous is abrar. And we talked about this two weeks ago on, on Friday. Who remembers where the term abrar comes from? Who can tell me where the term abrar comes from? Go ahead. Ascent. Uh huh. Fantastic, Ahsant, perfect. So the term bir comes from bar, and bar is the term that is used for land in opposition to the bahar, which is ocean. So the ocean is constantly wavy and is not stagnant and you know is not stable, whereas the bar it always stays stagnant, it is very stable. And this is what righteousness brings, that when a person is righteous, this will bring stability into his life. Whereas when a person loses that righteousness, then he will become unstable. One of the things that the scholars of tafsir mention over here is that the term abrar is jam'u killa, that it is a plural, but it shows that only a small group of people will be from the abrar. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say that the brooks of the abrar are fi aliyin, that they are in highness. Now when you think about highness, what do you actually think about? You think about the skies, you think about something that is very vast, as opposed to something which is very constrained. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the books of the righteous people. That they're in a place which is very beautiful. Some of them said that it is where the Sidrat al-Muntaha is. Some of them said it is in the highest levels of Jannah. But it just generally means that it is in a place of highness, in a place of beauty, in a place of openness, and not in a place of restriction. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the books of the righteous. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا عَلِّيُونَ And what will make you know what is this place known as Illiyun? Kitabu Markum. That Kitabu Markum, again, that it is well written and documented, it can't be changed, and as well as their good deeds are numbered one after another. Yashhadu al Mukarrabun. That those who are nearest have witnessed those deeds. Those are, that are nearest have witnessed those deeds. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the righteous people, they will always have people testify for them. The righteous people will always have people testify for them. Whereas that is never the case with the unrighteous people. 
that no one will ever testify for them. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when a person is righteous, people will testify to their righteousness. And this is what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves an individual, He tells Jibreel to love this individual, and the angels to love this individual, until this person is loved by everyone, and he has qubul in the nas, and he has acceptance with the people. So this is a sign of righteousness that when he has acceptance with the people, then bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, this is a clear indication of his righteousness. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ Now this is the same verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in Surah Al-Infitar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeating that verse over here. That this concept of that the people of righteousness, they will be in delight. Now this delight, as we mentioned, is not only in the hereafter, but it's in this dunya as well. That it is the cause of people being happy in this life. Your righteousness will be a cause of happiness for you in this life. It will be a cause of serenity and satisfaction. And every good emotion that you can think of will be a cause, uh, will be due to the righteousness that you did in this life. <laughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will place thrones for these individuals in the hereafter, in which they will you know, look over all of paradise. And this is like one of the most beautiful things, that whenever you stay in a hotel, usually when they have like elite guests in the hotel, they'll always put them on a higher floor. What is the wisdom behind that? The wisdom behind that is when you're on a higher floor, it gives you a more beautiful you know, vision of your surroundings. So you're on a higher floor, you can see everything that is around you. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that in paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prepare these thrones for all the righteous people. And you sit on that throne and as far as the eye can see, you're just seeing the blessings of Jannah. And one of the most beautiful things about it is that you're seeing everyone have a good time. So whatever a person wants to do and is content with, you know they'll be doing it. Someone may be farming, someone may be fishing, someone is out with their family in the park, someone is swimming you know, in the rivers of Jannah. And this is what you're seeing from your throne. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising the abrar. That they'll be on their throne just reclining and enjoying the view that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them. تَعْرِفُ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ نَظْرَةً نَعِيمٍ That you will see on their face the delight of brightness. Now this again is both in the dunya and akhirah. That one of the signs of righteousness in this dunya is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give a brightness to your face. And that brightness will be further increased in the hereafter. Now this is one of the blessings of Jannah, that in this life, as you get older, you know, your eyes start to wrinkle, you get these bags over your eyes, and as you get older, I mean, it's not to say that, you know, you become ugly, but you're not as beautiful as you once used to be, right? That is the, the natural case scenario. No one gets more beautiful with age, as a general case rule. Whereas in Jannah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He tells us that the, uh, the, the righteous people, the inhabitants of Jannah, every Friday they will go to the marketplace. Every Friday they'll all gather in the marketplace. And this shows us, SubhanAllah, that you know, on the day of Jum'ah, in this dunya we used to gather in the masajid, and in paradise Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala you know, gathers us in the marketplace. So in this dunya, the most blessed of people the most, most blessed of places is the masjid and the most cursed of places is the, is the marketplaces. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the marketplace in the hereafter where you can have everything that you desire. And there's no concept of payment. You know, you want like, you know, the PS4 is coming out or actually the PS4 already came out. You want a PS4? It's free in Jannah. You don't have to pay for it. So you go to the marketplace in Jannah and not only will you get what you want for uh, absolutely for free, but then when you come back, your family actually tells you, you came back more beautiful than when you left. So with age, the people of paradise, they're becoming more beautiful over time, subhanAllah. And that, you know, as, as, a, as a spouse, if you want to hear that from, you know, hearing that from your wife is like something great. Like when does your wife tell you you've come home more beautiful today? <laughs> that doesn't happen. Everyone who's married knows that. <laughs> you know, they're, they'll tell you, you know, you've put on weight, you look old, you know, all this, you're getting gray hair. But the fact that you come home and they tell you that you look more beautiful than you left, you know, this shows that the, the, the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place and over time, they will continually get more beautiful, subhanAllah. 
يُسْكَوْنَ مِنْ رَحِيكِ مَخْتُومَ And they will be given drink from Rahik al-Makhtum. Now, Makhtum is, means something that is sealed off. It is something that is Makhtum, it's something that is sealed. Now, what does the term Rahik actually mean? So some of the people said that it is, you know, the purest form of juice. So when you look at, you know, um, fruits like peaches, when you have the purest form of that juice, they call this juice a nectar, right? And that is why the Sira book is called Rahik al-Maktum, the sealed nectar, that's where it comes from. Another interpretation of this pure liquid is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُسْكَوْنَ مِنْ رَحِيكُ maktum, that it is the sealed bottles of alcohol that do not intoxicate. Of alcohol that does not intoxicate. So those people that didn't drink alcohol in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them those bottles of pure drink in the hereafter. And it's beautiful, you know, the way that these drinks are described. That Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, you know, particularly when he talks about the, the kawthar, he says that the kawthar that is given to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of which he will give with his own hands to the believers, may Allah make us from them, that each person will drink what he desires the most at that time. So for example, you know, Ibrahim, he wants chocolate milk, Kalas is gonna taste like chocolate milk. You know, uh, someone else wants Coke or Pepsi, they'll have Coke or Pepsi. Someone else wants water, they'll have water. Someone else wants juice, that liquid will change according to the desire that you have. You know, this is the beauty of, of paradise. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will have everything that they desire, it's not a lie, it's not an exaggeration. You will have each and every single thing that you desire in a way that your mind can't even ponder. That how can one drink satisfy the desire of everyone? When each person will have a different desire, this is the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. خِتَامُهُ misk wa fi ذَلِكَ mutanafisun. That the, the last, you know, sip that you have of it will be its finest sip. خِتَامُهُ misk That it will have the most, the greatest of fragrances, the greatest of tastes. wa fi ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافِسِلْ mutanafisun. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it is for these reasons, for these causes, that let the believers race with one another, compete with one another. Where does the term tanafasa come from? When an individual breathes, this is known as tanafus. This is known as to take a breath, right? And the breath is something that goes in and out, in and out, back and forth, back and forth. And a race, munafasa, is a race which goes back and forth. You know, between number one and two, they're always changing spots between one and two. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that let the believers compete with one another for these thrones in paradise, for these drinks in paradise, for, you know, the, the brightness of the face in this life and the hereafter. The believers are meant to compete with one another. And this is like one of the beautiful things that when it comes to the matters of the dunya, you know, we naturally have this competition. You see someone with a nice car, you'll wish that I wish I had that car. I wish I had that house. I wish you know, I had the, these technological devices. But when it comes to that, the akhirah, unfortunately, that desire isn't there. So you see someone doing an act of righteousness, it doesn't build that desire in you that I wish I was just as righteous as him. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that let a person beat you in the dunya. It doesn't matter, this dunya, it's useless, it's futile, it's, you're only in here for 60, 70 years, even if that. But the akhirah is an eternity. So if someone's beating you in their dunya, then make sure you destroy them in the akhirah. Not in the sense that you don't want them to go to Jannah, but in the sense that you have a higher level than them in Jannah. That's what you're aiming for, right? So when, this is like, uh, you know, um, I guess one of the ways that we always console ourselves, that you know, every time I meet my fa extended family members, one of the first questions that comes up is, have you bought a house yet? Right, that's like the biggest concern for them. Have you bought a house yet? And then every single time I'm like, no, I haven't bought a house yet. And the whole issue of, why don't you just take a loan? Why don't you just take a mortgage and all of this? And at that time I get really frustrated. And then, you know, they'll be talking about how they just bought like their second house or their third house or whatever. And I'll be like, in my head, Look, that's your dunya. Inshallah, we'll see what happens in the akhirah. Not to say that I, you know, I'm better than any of them. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say is that my competition with them is not in this dunya. You want a fourth house in this dunya? By all means, go ahead. In the akhirah, I would like to have you know, many, plenty of houses. That's what we should be aiming for. Bithnillahi ta'ala. That is what we should be aiming for. Bithnillahi ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that the believers will, should compete with one another. وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافِسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ وَمِزَاجُهُ مِنْ تَسْنِيمٍ 
and the drink that they will have, it is mixed with tasneem. The scholars differed. What does this term tasneem actually mean? They said, and what seems to be the majority opinion, is that it is a river in paradise that has its own liquid. So this liquid tasneem will be filled in with the other drinks that they have, and this is what will give its everlasting taste. That you know what will make its, its taste last for a very long time, it will quench your thirst for a very long time, it's because when it's mixed with this liquid from the river of a tasneem, that is what will cause it. That it is a spring whereof drink those nearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will drink from. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us that the tasneem is a river that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared those who are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to change the discussion a little bit. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا كَانُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَضْحَقُونَ that verily, those who committed crimes used to laugh at those who believed. So the people who were transgressors against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they used to laugh at the people of righteousness. They used to say that you're spending your whole lives worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You wake up in the middle of the night to worship your Lord. You, you know, you're not striving to earn more wealth. They used to laugh at these people. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that history will repeat itself. Now throughout the times, the transgressors, they will always mock the righteous people. They will always mock the righteous people in every age and every time. This is the sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. But that's not where the story ends. That's just where the story begins. And whenever the righteous people used to walk by the transgressors, they used to make eye gestures to them, say that, you know, look at this person, look at how poor they are, look at how, you know, backwards they are, look at how they're not focusing on getting a, you know, a good worldly life. They used to make eye gestures with one another. This is what Yadagha Mazun means, they used to make gestures with their eyes, almost when someone is like winking at them, not in a good way, but in a, in a bad way. And that when they used to return back to their families, they used to turn back in a state of, you know, pleasure and of joy. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving three characteristics for the transgressors and for whose hearts are sealed. That they used to mock the believers. They always used to point the believers out in terms of how backwards they were uh, with their gestures of their eyes. And then when they used to return back to their families, they used to turn back into a state of pleasure, and a state of happiness, in a state of delusion, that they used to think that, you know, this is a good and happy place, that they used to return back into a state of happiness. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, وَإِذَا رَأُوهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ لَضَالُونَ And that when they used to see the, the, the people of, of evil and wickedness, they would say that, so when they used to see the people, when the wicked people used to see the people of righteousness, they would say that these are the people that are astray. These are the people that are astray. Because they have no concern for the dunya, they've gone astray. But these disbelievers were not sent as watchers over the righteous people. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in this verse, and this is a very significant verse, that these sinners, these transgressors, they were not sent as protectors over you. They were not sent as watchers over you. So now this is another relevant verse because in Surah Al-Infitar, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the hafidhin, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to? He says that the hafidhun are the angels, that they document and witness each and every single thing that you do. Those are the ones who are the hafidhun that will protect you. And these sinners and transgressors, as powerful as you may see them to be, as mighty as you may see them to be, as wealthy as you may see them to be, they are not going to be able to do anything for you. They can't protect you. They're not even watching everything that you do. And they will be of no avail to you in the hereafter. So here, as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that ignore the critics. Someone is saying bad stuff about you, just let it be. It's not worth anything in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who the true hafideen are, are the angels. That on this day, on the day of judgment, it is the believers who will be laughing over the disbelievers. And this is where the story concludes. That in this dunya, let them laugh, let them make fun of the believers, let them make fun of those that submit, let them make fun of the ones that don't want to drink, don't want to you know, touch the opposite gender. Call us all of these names, because at the end it is going to be the believers who are laughing. 
It is going to be the believers who are laughing. They are going to have the, the last say. That they will have the last laugh on the day of judgment. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they will be the ones who are on the thrones looking down into the hellfire at the disbelievers. That this is what you put forth in this dunya. Allah gave you what you strived for and Allah gave us what we strived for as well. And this is why we're reclining on these, thro on these thrones. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the surah and are the disbelievers not paid in full for what they used to do. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like taking like a jab at them. Like just how you used to cheat the people in the dunya because you were from the mutaffifin. Then on this day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing you what true justice is. That the sins that you committed, Allah is compensating you them in full measure. There is no cheating on the scales today. You will have a full measure of what you paid for in this dunya. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the surah. Now this surah is actually one of my, one of my favorite surahs in Juz Amma. Just because of all the delightful things about paradise, but even the ending is so powerful. You know, it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has like put you through a movie, like your life is a movie. That you go through all these trials where people will mock you, they'll make fun of your faith, they'll make fun of your Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the conclusion of the movie that on the day of judgment, it's the people that were like mocked and made fun of, they are the victorious ones. They are the ones that are, you know, enjoying paradise and everyone else is suffering in the hellfire. So this shows us, you know, the glad tidings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the believers and the misfortunate news that the disbelievers will have in the hereafter. So now the, the point over here is not that a person should wish the hellfire for anyone. Obviously we want everyone to go to paradise. If we can guide someone to paradise, that is what we should be doing. But at the end of the day, if they cho if choose to refuse to enter paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear what their end result will be. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those people who are good in their conduct, do not cheat the people. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from the abrar and makes us of those whose books are in the illiyin and makes us of those that have nadratun na'im ala wujuhi, fi wujuhihim and makes us of those that are from the ala al-ara'iki yanzurun. Allahumma ameen. And that he grants us the tawfiq to see the beautiful face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. Ameen. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa barak ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We will take three questions bi ta'ala. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the, the term uh, uh, Righteousness? Abrar. Yeah, so, so abrar is the plural for bar or bar. And bar and bar are terms that are used when someone is righteousness. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about righteousness that should be shown to our parents, we're meant to show bir towards them. And what this means towards our parents at the very least is that we show them obedience with love. So for example, your parents tell you to take out the garbage. You can take out the garbage, but you're upset on the inside. This wouldn't be considered bir. Bir would be that they tell you to take out the garbage and you're happy to do something in their service. This is what bir actually means. So bir is that unconditional obedience that is filled with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is when a person becomes from the abrar and that is why there are so few of them. That even most of us when we do acts of righteousness, it's because we just want to get it done and over with or we just want the reward. It's not purely done out of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Question number two, go ahead. Yeah. Is it the same book that the one that uh, two are fighting? Or the Sorry, it is the same book that? Is it the same book that half the one are writing at the, at the time they are alive? Yes, it? that's what it seems like that the, the books that the half the one are writing, that after is. After we die, because we have to Exactly, and that's where it's stored until it's given to you on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> Last question, Bid Nai Ta'ala. Go ahead. Right, so he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about where these books are stored till they're given to them. He's not talking about where the abrar will be in the, uh, in the day. Right, 
So this is, goes back to the, the point what we mentioned previously that entering Jannah is purely based upon the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one can do a good deed that will enter them into paradise. But what will distinguish a person who is in the lowest of Jannah into the highest of Jannah is the deeds that they used to do. Right? So the deeds that, they, that you do, the more deeds you do, the higher in Jannah you will be. Wallahu ta'ala alam.